So, um, so thanks uh, for the invitation. It's great to be here. This is really uh, interesting and very uh, cross-disciplinary, which is where I love to be, <clears throat> sitting at the intersection of different disciplines. And Dave tarnished me a bit with the brush of neuroeconomics. I certainly have had a long history with the field, um, but I'm going to hopefully uh, give you a few reasons to maybe think a little bit differently about how we should practice uh, decision neuroscience and, and kind of what we might expect about how the brain actually might uh, mediate or process decisions. Um, so uh, most of the work that's gone on in neuroeconomics and decision neuroscience, this merger of, or at least intersection of, of kind of the methods and, and background of economics with, with contemporary neuroscience methods, is that when we make a choice, if we're choosing between, say, uh, I don't know, a 1985 uh, Chateau Margaux and a, a unvintage uh, blush wine from the Poconos, um, we're going to have a very strong preference. And when we actually come upon the choice that we're going to make, we're going to do something like evaluate the evidence that's there, uh, bracket that against our experience and our, our own kind of predilections for full wines versus not then that will all be boiled down into something like a utility or subjective value um, that would, could then be compared for the two options. And then whichever comparison wins, you might you choose that option, you plan the action, you select the choice. In fact, if you look at kind of most models that are on, you know, out there in the field, uh, that's in fact what they do. They start with the external world, and they kind of bracket against one's internal state. And then uh, boil all, all of this information down into uh, some sort of uh, values that can be compared. And what's really interesting is that over the last 15 years or so, neuroscientists have been steadily basically assigning these processes to different uh, parts of the brain. So you kind of move from outward uh, in, from uh, taking in a kind of perceptual information uh, and comparing that against uh, remembered or le learned information that you've stored in memory. And then there's this magical thing that happens somewhere up in the frontal lobe uh, in the medial uh, prefrontal cortex and orbital frontal cortex that somehow takes all this information and computes value or utility. You know, people feel differently about those terms. I'm going to use them relatively interchangeably. And then, and then, whoops, and then you go on to make an action, choose an action. And this is, a, a, I think, a, you know, a very emblematic study. It comes from a friend, Hilke Plossman, when she was working with Antonio Rangel. Uh, Caltech, and she basically gave people this exact choice that I just gave you. Uh, not those exact same wines, but people were choosing between uh, wines while lying in an MRI machine and their brains were being scanned. Uh, and the fun twist on this is that uh, what Hilke did was to basically give people what were physically the same wines, but uh, told them that they were uh, the higher or lower priced. And generally, we tend to think that you get what you pay for uh, in wine. Uh, and so, of course, people tended to say that they preferred the more expensive wines over the less expensive wines, even though it's the same, you know, red Kool-Aid or whatever. Uh, and lo and behold, remarkably, when they you know, had people lying in a scanner and they were measuring blood flow to various parts of this, these magical areas in the prefrontal cortex, you saw a stronger signal when people were actually drinking, when they are consuming the wine, that they believed was higher value and that they preferred. Okay, so this is... The, the, the stuff that neuroeconomics is really made of, right? This is, this is really what it's all about. Your brain distilling the environment into some sets of values or utilities that exactly align up with kind of the theory that has been out there in economics for really kind of hundreds of years. But what I want to uh, kind of, my rejoinder to this is to say that, you know, almost all of the kinds of choices that are given to people in uh, neuroscientific or, or animals in, in neuroscientific experiments involve options that are very well learned, okay, and um, and that involve explicit, uh, immediate kinds of consumption uh, opportunities. Okay, so it could be wine, it could be food, it could be Coke, Pepsi taste test, you name it. But we know that a lot of, at least I would argue, that a lot of the decisions we make when we are kind of moving about the world as you. Uh, made your way up here to Columbia today. Maybe you encountered something like this, although it wasn't raining, I don't think. Um, where you were not necessarily you know, getting immediate rewards for turning left or turning right, or looking in one direction or another. More or less, you were moving through the world um, in, a, in a relatively deliberate way, and you were also taking in information. Okay, And I think this is actually key, that one of the 
the processes that we probably devote a lot of our time to and a lot of our, our, our cerebral power is to the acquisition of, of information. Uh, and how and whether the sort of circuits that we think mediate the kind of consumptive decisions that underlie these economic choices that I've told you about before, how and, and whether they contribute to decision making kind of in, in this kind of situation, I think remains completely uh, unknown. Um, it's a kind of difficult question to ask. It's hard to have people walking around with an MRI machine strapped to their back. Uh, it's pretty heavy so far, but maybe the technology will improve. Uh, and so um, what we have done, and this is something I always do in my lab, which is if I really want to know the answer to a difficult question, I don't ask a person, I ask a monkey. Uh, and uh, monkeys are a really good, uh, good individual to ask these kinds of questions of because they're, uh, they're, they're motivated, they, they come to play the game every day. Uh, you can gather copious amounts of data from them, and they generally tend to respond to the same sorts of opportunities that we do, and they seem to be motivated by a lot of the same concerns. Uh, and in particular, a lot of the concerns that we've studied is the ways that, the ways that monkeys uh, acquire and evaluate information that can lead to subsequent adaptive behavior. And so here, here what I'm telling you about is something that's completely unpublished, and um, so I would love feedback on this. And what we did was to give monkeys, uh, put monkeys in a task, it's sort of a two-phase decision-making task, okay? And uh, they're initially presented with a blank screen, uh, they have to fixate on the center, and then they're given a choice of two options. This is sort of your economic choice. Do you want uh, the, the Chateau Margaux or the blush wine from the Poconos? And, uh, but in this case, what they're given a choice of are, are different colored uh, circles, and those colors are going to indicate whether the monkey will uh, get to uh, watch a video or not. Uh, whether he uh, repeats the last five seconds of the video that he saw on the last trial, last go-round, uh, continue the next five seconds, see what's going to happen, right, or switch to a new channel. So this is basically we've given monkeys a remote control. They're sitting in front of the television and they're up channel surfing and, you know, maybe they come upon something they like and they're interested and they watch for a few seconds or minutes. Maybe they change the channel. Maybe they want to rewind. You know, they're on fail blog. Wow, that's really exciting to see uh, a monkey fall on a tree or something like that. And then. Once they've made their choice, then the monkeys are free to watch the movie while it plays for five seconds, and we monitor their eye position <coughs> very um, precisely at a thousand times a second, so we know exactly where they're looking at every moment in the movie. And then uh, the movies, of course, are not, you know, they're not watching HBO and Showtime, but they're watching the equivalent uh, for monkeys, so these are hundreds of hours of video that we uh, recorded on uh, Monkey Island off the coast of Puerto Rico, uh, where there are about 1,500 monkeys that are free living on this island. We know everything about those monkeys. That's a separate story. But we capture monkeys doing monkey things. Uh, they're eating, drinking, moving, uh, fighting, mating, grooming, uh, sitting around doing nothing, uh, as well as nothing happening. So we have videos of, of leaves blowing in the wind and the waves crashing on the shore. So you have sort of dynamic motion, but not necessarily things that monkeys should necessarily be interested in. And moreover, these are all monkeys that are monkeys in our colony. Uh, this was in Durham, North Carolina, had never seen before. Okay, so they sort of they have no experience with them. Uh, and, then, and then we see what happens. Um, and this is what I just told you about all the things that are going on. Oh, one thing that's really important about this is that, and it's a heroic, it was a heroic effort on the part of the graduate student who did this work, Jeff Adams, is that we, um, he and a, a team of undergraduates actually annotated every video using ethogram of behaviors. So basically every um, frame of the video uh, they indicated what was happening in that video, so we know precisely what's going on. Okay, so that's really important. Uh, and this is just sort of an example of what this looks like. And what I'm plotting, all those little dots are the eye positions of different monkeys watching the movie the, at the, this uh, this section of a film. And the ones that are all blue mean that that the blue monkey had watched it several times, so he'd chosen to see this on several occasions. And you can see that. Um, and the, I know that the cinema quality is terrible, but I mean, for a lot of reasons, we now know how to make better movies. But the thing that's interesting is you can see that sometimes, like there, all the dots converge on each other, and sometimes they're dispersed all over the place. And so um, we think that this, that, at the monkey's behavior itself, their looking behavior, gives us a, a clue, a hook, into the, the meaning, the meaningfulness 
of those particular uh, pixels on the screen at that particular point in the movie. So if a, if a point attracts attention of a, a, a monkey every single time he watches it, and every single monkey as well, we think that probably is pretty meaningful. We can't derive that uh, mathematically, but we can demonstrate it based on their behavior. The first thing is we can look at our kind of economic choice. And these are just different pairings for three different monkeys uh, playing this game. Uh, pairings of these different uh, choices, blank, continue, repeat, switch. Generally, uh, monkeys like new information, like people, so they tend to channel surf more than you would expect. Um, perhaps uh, they also like to continue watching a movie that they've started if it has something interesting going on, we think. Uh, and they almost, they almost never want to, uh, they'll, they'll watch something again occasionally and they almost never want to see a blank screen. Okay, and that makes some sense too. Uh, from those uh, ordered um, pairwise uh, comparisons of the rates of choosing, we can derive estimates of relative utility of these different options, which just recapitulates what I said. Monkeys like to switch, they like to find new information and explore. Uh, and occasionally they like to see what's going to happen next uh, in a video. Now, as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot going on in these videos, and it's our, it was our hunch that uh, the content of the videos actually is really important for guiding the monkey's choices moment to moment while they're watching the videos, as well as perhaps the choices of the different outcomes, that, the different options that were on display. And so this is basically showing you how our, our um, the way that we could identify with it at any one particular moment in time, any frame, what was going on in the video. This is just a, a single um, kind of example. It also shows that many of these things are highly, you know, they're correlated with each other. Like if you don't have monkeys on the screen, you can't have monkeys grooming. You have to have two monkeys that are grooming, et cetera. Um, so this is actually a bit of a challenge as well, which I'll, I'll get back to in a moment, which is the, the highly uh, correlated and interrelated uh, nature of the data, which is, I think, something that is the kind of challenge we'll all have to overcome when we're trying to understand more complex, you know, really you know, realistic kinds of decisions. It's not just two things at once. Um, to, to actually uh, evaluate and, and put a value on um, the, the, what we might think of as the meaningfulness of each pixel on the screen, uh, we uh, took a nod from uh, analyses of the movement of charged particles. Uh, and so basically what we're doing is any time uh, to, uh, this is a, a, a value that will describe how close together uh, different, all the different spots are on the screen. And so this is within a single monkey, we call that uh, gaze consistency. Um, here's kind of what it looks like. So what's running on the bottom is in the black curve, you'll, you'll see a trace running along. The black curve is this gaze consistency measure. Oops, sorry about that. Why don't you want to play? I'm not sure. There we go. So if you look here, as this kind of scrolls through time, you'll see when all the spots bunch up, then this gaze consistency measure goes up, as we would like it to. And we also have a different measure, which is our gaze typicality which is something similar, but uh, reflects how, how, how similarly different monkeys actually uh, view these different movies. Uh, and it turns out, this turns out to be very interesting as a potential metric for discovering uh, differences between individuals of any sort when they're watching movies. Okay, so these are our measures uh, during, um, during movie watching. And uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of our variables are highly intercorrelated. And it doesn't really matter other than to say that we use a particularly uh, kind of new and fancy kind of regression uh, technique that allows us to kind of pull out the really strong, important variables and squash all the other variables uh, to zero okay, to kind of see what's there. And one thing that's pretty interesting is that um, there are certain kinds of things that are happening in these movies that seem to be associated with uh, high information content, high potential information value. And I'll just kind of, you can't read these, I know, but um, so here, for this is whether the monkeys are even looking at the screen, and this is gaze consistency, so they're, they're related to each other. This is uh, seeing uh, monkeys threaten each other, uh, aggression, um, eating behavior, putting food up to the mouth. Monkeys really love to watch that, it's pretty interesting. 
Um, it, maybe that go goes with this sort of big um, internet thing where people are watching. You know, this is a big popular in Korea. People love to watch people eat food. Uh, the monkeys really like to as well. Uh, anytime there are genitals on the screen uh, and whether there are lots of monkeys. Okay, so this is all, and this makes sense, right? This is sort of the business of being a monkey, right? Eating, fighting, fleeing, and okay, I'll leave it at that. Um, okay, so what's going on in the brains of these guys? Well, you know, one of the great things is here that we don't have to rely on uh, non-invasive uh, means of assessing brain function. Uh, so uh, we are actually directly recording the activity of neurons uh, within the brains of these monkeys, and we. What I'm plotting here are t examples uh, from two areas in the prefrontal cortex, one in the orbital frontal cortex. This is the area that um, basically uh, is supposed to be colored with your, your subjective value, your, the utility that you ascribe to something, right? It's the one that is modulated whether you, dep whether you think the wine is more expensive or not. Um, and this is a, a neuron from a second area in the lateral part of the prefrontal cortex that's supposed to be involved in the translation of utility information to the actual decision that, that an individual makes. And there are a couple things that are interesting here. One is that uh, these neurons uh, fire, we're comparing blue, uh, choosing a movie versus blank, and we know the monkeys generally like movies over watching nothing. And you see a modulation activity. These neurons fire harder when the monkeys are choosing than when they're going to choose to watch the movie. But I think the other thing that's really interesting to observe here is that this activity goes on and on and on throughout the actual viewing uh, of the movie. So uh, this is not indicative of an area, I think, that uh, kind of is turned on when you are confronted with you know, an apple and an orange and you have to make a decision. And you, you quickly retrieve the values of those options. You compare them and you make your choice. Instead, these neurons seem to be continuously querying the environment uh, for what's important. And I think that, that is a, a new insight. And this is just basically showing the same thing across our population of neurons. So each row is a different neuron. And the red to blue index is the, the modulation from baseline. So in the orbital frontal cortex, during the there, when the monkeys are watching the video, we see very strong activity. Um, both increasing and decreasing uh, levels of activity, sort of reiterating what I showed you from the example. Um, if we actually now break this out by, the, and this is across the population, by the economic value of the different options, well, lateral prefrontal cortex is sort of doing what we hope it would do. Uh, that is, it responds highest when the monkey's going to switch, because that's what he likes, the monkeys like to do most. They love to uh, explore. Uh, in an intermediate level for choosing to see what's going to happen next, and uh, responding the least for choosing the blank option, right? So these neurons in the lateral prefrontal cortex seem to, at least during the choice phase, encode something about the economic value of those two options to the monkey. The orbital frontal neurons are quite different. So there's, a, there's some modulation during the economic choice phase, but then basically the neurons are firing uh, strongly throughout the viewing of the movie, and they don't care whether the whether the, you know, whether the monkey's chosen to watch something again or watch the next thing uh, or choose to watch a new movie. So they're basically continuously firing throughout that movie. What are they doing during that continuous firing? This is um, a challenge, uh, actually, to try to address because we have a bunch of things more or less tangled up. But what we can say from uh, using this uh, elastic net regression technique is that we can identify that individual neurons seem to carry information about the movie content. So here in the orbital frontal cortex, this is supposed to be utility uh, neurons. We see that this neuron is fires harder here in green when the monkey's watching a movie that's all about eating, uh, compared with when he's watching a movie all about grooming, which is the number one positive social behavior that monkeys engage in. Here's a different neuron that responds very strongly when, uh, when the monkeys are watching a movie in which, which other monkeys are grooming, right? They're having, displaying positive social behavior, and basically this, this neuron is quiescent otherwise. Okay, so if we look across our populations of neurons, and these are all the different things that can happen in the movies, or at least that we, uh, and we coded. From those movies, we see here in blue that the orbital frontal cortex has a high proportion of neurons that are basically carrying information about all the different qualities of the movies, the content of the movies, uh, which we know in, in some cases actually uh, systematically driving the monkey's uh, visual exploration behavior in other uh, instances is not. And I think this is a real kind of challenge for current uh, thinking, kind of neuroeconomic thinking about how this process might actually play out, or at least the ways that it, it is 
uh, carried out by circuits in the brain. And I think is more, um, kind of this is, I should be up to, sorry, this point. It, it's more in line with a view, I think, that, uh, that, that I subscribe to, at least for much of decision-making behavior, perhaps not the ones that my um, co-panelists have discussed, but we'll, we'll see how, how close we can get on this. But rather that thinks about, um, sorry, that thinks about uh, the kinds of problems that brains evolved to solve originally, right? And evolution uh, basically works with the simplest, most effective and efficient solution that uh, it can get its hands on. And um, we would suppose, uh, propose, as we have before, that, for example, one of the most uh, important problems that any animal has to solve is basically foraging for food foraging for resources of any kind, mates, et cetera. We know from work in behavioral ecology and from optimality modeling work that there's, there's, there is an optimal solution to this problem of how long you stick with an option uh, that is you know, giving you a little payoff before you uh, explore the environment. Uh, people and animals, you know, subsistence foragers, uh, animals in a variety of different environments um, seem to conform to this, um, to this algorithm. They behave according to this algorithm. And people do, people in kind of westernized, uh, you know, computer literate societies do as well. So even people who are uh, foraging for information on the internet, I'm not explaining the graph that we can talk about later, people who are foraging for information on the internet seem to do the same thing. So they basically will stick with a website as long as it's providing a strong information sent, but then will switch and explore uh, alternative websites when, um, when that, the value of that information is the average for the environment as a whole. And there are some interesting predictions from foraging theory for this. Well, we would suggest that, well, once you know, evolution's got a circuit that can do this, it can now apply it to a bunch of other things, whether it's searching for information, searching for mates, et cetera. And that rather than the brain kind of conforming to an economist's um, sense of what it might look like, that is taking all the information that's out there and boiling it down into a set of values that can be compared, maybe there are a bunch of different uh, labeled lines, if you will, that uh, can drive different behaviors to different strengths depending on the kind of inputs that are coming in and the state of the organism. And so what I would argue is that what we should be trying to do is not necessarily um, solely mer you know, bring neuroscience and economics uh, into some sort of uh, union, but rather they need to be bracketed by a larger thinking, a broader thinking about how it is that and why it is that brains evolved their, the, the current way that they are uh, constituted to solve the kinds of problems that uh, animals and people face in their natural lives. 